Good evening. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Uh, as you all know, most of you know that the elders had decided uh, last night to cancel our Bible classes for this evening. However, we did meet for a, a short period of devotional, and we sang songs, we prayed, and, and we had a, a short devotional. But I decided to go ahead and record a, this Bible study for those to, to watch at their leisure. And, and so that's why you have this extra video this evening. And, and what I wanted to do, as you can see, I'm going to try my best to stay uh, in one spot because to your right, my left, uh, you see the PowerPoint screen and it's really, really big. And the reason is I'm here by myself this afternoon, and and so I decided to record uh, this and, and to make it as easy as possible since no one is upstairs to be flipping back and forth uh, from the screen uh, as we, we have it right now. Uh, I wanted to just go ahead and, and do what we've got uh, with this so you could actually see uh, what we have going on this evening. So what I wanted us to do in this short period of time we have to, to really talk about how we got the, the English Bible. And so how did we get that? How did we, we get from what the Bible was written in its original language to the, the English Bible that we hold and, and that we keep in our houses and, and bring to services with us and, and, and such as that? No matter if it's the King James Version, the the, the New King James, the American Standard, uh, you know, whatever version, the English Standard, whatever version you use, how did we get there? And so we're not going to look at those individual versions, uh, if you will. We're just going to take a step back and we're going to look at the English Bible. First, let's look at an overview of the Bible itself, a history of the Bible, if you will. Let's think about how 40 men over a 1400 period from various backgrounds wrote this book. There are those who claim that, well, the Bible, it was, it's just made up from man and, and all these men got in a room and, and, and they wrote this book. No, they didn't. These men lived at different times. They had different backgrounds. They weren't all the, from the same background. You think about it, Amos. Uh, Amos was a farmer. You, you think about Jeremiah and Ezekiel, how, how they were priests. Daniel, Daniel was a statesman. You have Peter and John, they were fishermen. You had Luke, who was a doctor or a physician. Then you had a, a man named Matthew, who was simply a, a tax collector or former tax collector. And so all these different backgrounds, all these different years that these 40 men wrote the Bible. And not only did, did they write it, and some will say, well, okay, but maybe it was a cult cultural thing. Maybe it was a location thing. And that's the reason they were all be able to write this book, that this volume of, of, of letters, if you will, this volume of, of, of books, and it not have one single contradiction. Well, folks, that's, it has nothing to do with location because as you see on the screen there, uh, they, they lived in various countries. Uh, some lived in Israel. Some lived in Babylon. Some lived in Greece. Some were in Italy when they wrote their letter. How did they write it? How did all these different men from these different time frames, from these different locations, Write the Bible without one single contradiction. Well, it's easy. It's because they wrote it from one spirit. It was inspired by God. In other words, God told them oh, what to write. Think about what the Bible says about this. In, in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 20, Paul, or Peter rather says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
They didn't think of it in their own private mind, but rather it was, they were given, to, given it by the Holy Spirit. Paul would claim in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works or to every good work. It was literally God-breathed. Paul would also say in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 10 and going through verse 13, he would say, but God has revealed them to us, how? Through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? How do we know about ourselves except what's inside of us? Tells us. He said, even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit, of, uh, the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing the spiritual things with spiritual. Paul says we don't know about ourselves unless it's, it's what's in us tells us about ourselves. Therefore, we can't know about God unless God himself tells us. And that's exactly what God did. He did it through these men, these 40 men, over this 1,400 pe uh, time period. 1,400 years, rather. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37, If anyone thinks himself spiritual or a prophet, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are commandments of the Lord. They're the commandments of the Lord. I had one man tell me, well, I, I, I'm a, a red letter Christian. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I, I only go by what is written in red, what Jesus said. Well, folks, according to the Holy Spirit, according to God, according through, through writing through Paul, he says, we can't do that. Paul says, what I'm writing to you are from the Lord. It doesn't matter if they're in red, black, blue. doesn't matter what kind of ink they're in. He says they are in this book and, and they're scripture and that's what it is. It's the commandments of God. They are called scripture. Peter would say that, that, that in, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, he would say, Consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all of his epistles, speaking in them the things which some things are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do to the rest of the what? He says to the rest of the scriptures. That's what it's called. That's why we, we, we call this the scriptures. Not because we call it that, but because God, through Peter, called it the scriptures. Think about what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, going through verse 5. He says, For this reason, Paul, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, and if indeed you have heard the of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Talking about the, the miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit to write these things. He says, how that by revelation he has made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Then he who sat on the throne, or rather, rather stop right there let's, before we go to Revelation, he says, these things I write to you. Some people will say, well, you know, the Bible, it's, it's just too hard to read. 
It's too hard to understand. I, I can't understand it. Paul says, hogwash. Yes, you can. When you read it, you can understand because why? God's given this to me by revelation. God wants you to understand him. God wants you to understand what he wants for you. God wants you to understand how to be saved. Paul says it's all been revealed, and here it is. So when you read it, you can understand it. Think about how many times the Bible, the, these, these people were told to write these things. Just to give you a couple examples. Revelation chapter 21 and, and verse 15. John, in his revelation, writes, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 27. Moses is there with God. And Moses says, writes that then the Lord said to Moses, Write these words. According to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. He says, Write. Think about Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 30, one and two, verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, or the word came that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write. In a book for yourself, all the words that I have spoken to you. And finally, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 1. Isaiah say, uh, says that the Lord told him to take a large scroll and write on it with man's pen. He says, you write it. And you write it. That's what Isaiah did and these writers of the New Testament and the Old Testament did. But we have it given to us by one spirit. And we have it in one volume. A volume of a collection of 66 books divided in the Old Testament, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The Old Testament containing 39 books. 27 books are contained within the New Testament. You think about the Old Testament and how it was written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Daniel and Ezra wrote part of their books in Aramaic. And there are some other places in the Old Testament that were written in Aramaic. Primarily, though, it was written in Hebrew. The Old Testament is divided into four categories. Five, if you want to divide this last part uh, into two, you can do that. But we'll talk about that when we get there. But primarily four categories. You have the Pentateuch, uh, the, the first five books of the Bible written by Moses. That's Genesis through Deuteronomy. You have the historical books, uh, the next 12 books there, uh, from Joshua to Esther. You have the poetic and, and wisdom literatures books. That's from, from the five books from Job to the Song of Songs, or as some we refer to, the Song of Solomon. You have the, the last section, that fourth and final section. As I said, some people divide it into two sections. You have the prophets, the major and the minor prophets. But if you combine them together, you just have the prophets. And that's 17 books from Isaiah into Malachi, the end of the Old Testament. Then you think about the, the Hebrew Old Testament. If you go back and, you, and the Hebrews, they kind of uh, divided the, the Bible a little different than we'd have it in the, the English language. They, they divide it. The Jews today still divide it this way. They have what they call the law or the Torah. And, and it would be the Pentateuch, as we would call it, uh, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, what, what Moses wrote. Then they divide it into the prophets, the Nabim, which is the former prophets, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Then the latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the book of 12. They, they take the 12 minor prophets and they put them all in one book. And then you have the writings, the, the, the poetic books of Psalms, Job, I'm sorry but not capitalizing Job there, but Psalms, Job, and Proverbs, the five scrolls of, of Ruth, the songs of song, or, 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 or the song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, Esther, 
And then you have the historical books of Daniel, Ezra, through Nehemiah, and the Chronicles. Now, now one thing they did is when, the, when they divide up the Bible, when, especially when you think about um, as we have it, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles, uh, they don't have that. They just have the book of Samuel. And that contains both what we consider First and Second Samuel. They have the book of the Kings, and it contains just First and Second Kings. And then they have the book of the Chronicles, and that contains First and Second Chronicles. It wasn't divided under the Hebrew, the Jewish uh, state, if you will. Uh, it was divided later on uh, into two different books. So a lot of times, especially when you read in the book of Kings, and it says isn't, and it's talking about a certain king, and, and paraphrasing here, it will say that that isn't the rest of what this certain king did, not in, in the book of Chronicles. It doesn't say in the book of First Chronicles. It doesn't say in the book of First Second or Second Chronicles. It just says in the in the Chronicles, and, and that's how the, the the Jews divided it up. It, it's amazing to do a study on on how they were able to make copies of the original writings. You you had scribes that would sit down and and they would write literally. The, the, the words uh, from, from a, a, a previous copy or, or, or maybe even from an original, uh, but they would sit down and, and, and write from these copies the, the, the Bible, write it by hand. And of course, they don't go from, as we do, from left to right, top to bottom. They actually went from, from right to left, bottom to top. So it's kind of backwards how we write. And these scribes would sit, and, and, and as they would write, if they came to the word God or Yahweh, they would not use the same pen for the entire word of Yahweh. They would write one letter, discard that pen, never to use it again. Take another pen and write the second letter, discard that, never to use it again. And, and on until they got the word Yahweh written. And that's how the reverent they were to that name, Yahweh, God, Jehovah, that, that we have today. They were very, very reverent when it came to that, that word. Sometimes they would just write the first letter, not deeming themselves good enough, if you will, worthy enough to finish writing the entire word. Yahweh. But so you had started out these Old Testament books written in Hebrew and Aramaic. And then you come to later on in about 250 to uh, BC, and it's in Alexandria, Egypt, and the Septuagint is born. It is the Greek. Translation of the Hebrew Bible. It contained extra books called the Apocrypha. And the Apocrypha, we talked about this a little bit on Wednesday nights uh, when we were doing our Old Testament overview and when we were talking about the Inner Testament period. But the Apocrypha, uh, it, it's additions to the Old Testament. It's, it's, it's found a lot in the, the Catholic Bibles. If you have an old Catholic Bible, you will find these 14 additional books. And you have this list there, uh, there on, on the side there to, to your right. The Apocrypha simply means hidden. It is also called the, the Deuteronical, can, can, canonical rather, or, or second canon to, the, to distinguish them in value from the first canon or the rest of the biblical text. Protestant Bibles, or, or, or mainly your mainstream Bibles, if you will, do not consider these to be a part of the inspired Word of God, though they do have some useful historical information, and we talked about that when we were going through the Intertestament period. A lot of historical events 
that happened within the intertestament period or the, the inter, intertestamental period are written within these books, especially the books of First and Second Maccabees. So you can go back and, and they have good historical value, but they are, as you can read through them, you will tell very quickly these are not inspired books. They just have a, a different flow to them. Then you get to the New Testament. The New Testament was written, and it contains 27 books, as we said, different, five different, um, I, I guess you can divide divisions of them. You have the first four books of the, uh, of the New Testament considered the gospel accounts or the gospel account written by different men. That's Matthew through John. You have the, the one his, historical book, uh, uh, the book of Acts. Unfortunately, it is probably the most overlooked book of the New Testament among many religious organizations. Uh, I had a lady tell me one time she went to a certain religious organization school uh, when she was little and said they were studying the Bible. They got to the book of Acts. The teacher said, we're not going to study this book because you're not going to be able to understand it. Plus, it has no value uh, to your life as a Christian anyway. And, and which is surprising to me because without the, the book of Acts, we don't know uh, what the first century church did. We have no example of what the first century church did. Uh, you know, not, not much an example of the first century church. So it is a very important book. It is the, the his, history of the acts or the doings of the apostles. Then you have the 12 epistles, uh, Romans through Philemon. Then you have eight general books, Hebrews through Jude, and the one book of, of, that is considered prophecy, which is Revelation. The New Testament was written in the original language of Greek. Then the, the New Testament later on was, was translated into the Latin Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate is, uh, is the, the translation uh, of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. It was translated by Jerome around th between uh, 383 to 405 A.D. Jerome, however, he claimed that he was inspired by God, which he really wasn't. Then you have some, some Eastern versions uh, of the Bible that's out there. That was out there. You had the, the Syriac versions, of course, Syriac being Syria. Uh, this, some people are in a debate whether the Syriac versions were right after the Latin Vulgate or right before the Latin Vulgate. Then you had the Coptic versions. These are the versions that came out of Egypt. Uh, then you had the Armenian versions and, and, and just several others. In 1454, the first Latin Bible was printed with a movable printing station thanks to this man on the screen, or a depiction of this man on the screen, Johann Gutenberg. And so the first Bible was printed in 1454. Up until then, they would simply just sit down and write it and simply write it out by hand. And so you were able to have some kind of uh, semi-mass production, if you will, uh, in 1454 uh, of the Bible. So let's begin and let's finish this, this uh, talk and talk about the English Bible. The first English Bible was the Wycliffe Bible. Very tiny, as you can tell uh, here on your screen. It was around uh, 1382 in England. It came about. Then you had the Tyndale Bible. It was a printed Bible. In 1526 was the New Testament. The Old Testament, or at least portions of it, wasn't finished until 1534. And then in 1535, Cloverdale came out with a Bible, an English Bible. And, and it kind of took the world by storm, the English world. But then you had Matthew's Bible that came out. 1537, and not too many people used the Matthews Bible. Many of them were still clinging on to the Wycliffe or, or the Cloverdale, 
uh, but many of them tended to go back to the Wycliffe or, or even uh, the Tyndale Bible. And then so finally in 1539, the Great Bible w- was given. And it was translated by Cloverdale, who did his Cloverdale Bible just four years earlier. It was known by its large pages, 16 and a half by 11. Henry VIII decreed that the Great Bible was to be placed in every church. In 1543, Parliament passed a law forbidding the lower classes to read the Tyndale Bible. Uh, You you have, Cloverdale was very, very jealous, if you will, of Tyndale. And so so he had a lot of persuasion on this. So they they said, you know, if you are in the lower class, you can't read this Tyndale Bible. And then in 1547, Edward VI reversed Henry's decree. However, Mary came to the throne in 1553, and and Edward's Reformation policy was reversed. And some of those responsible for making copies of the translation were burned at the stake. So here you have, you're in the 1500s, and you have people literally just getting angry, and laws making, telling you which version of the Bible you could read. And if you're found with a version that wasn't lawful for you to read, they would burn you at the stake. They would literally kill you for it. There is a a museum in in Germantown, Tennessee, just outside of Memphis. And, And it's simply called the Bible Museum. And it's very small. But, but it has some great things uh, in it. If you ever go to Memphis on a, on a weekend trip or something, I, I really encourage you to go by there if it's open and, and look and just take a, a quick tour of it. We did that when I was at the school of preaching, and, and they have where desk, replica desk, uh, from that era in the 1500s where people would literally have to take their Bibles and hide it under the desk so that when the authorities would come that they would not find their copy of their English Bible. Because if they were found, not only was the Bible destroyed, but a lot of times they were killed. Then, in 1557, the Geneva Bible came, came into play. It was written by or translated by a man named William Wittenham. He fled Egypt under Mary's reign to Geneva and produced an English version of the New Testament. Wittenham was the brother-in-law of John Calvin's wife. The marginal notes were clearly Calvinistic in nature or in doctrine and expressed anti-Roman sentiments. You can still order a, a, a... updated version, copy of this Geneva Bible today. Then you had the Bishop's Bible. The Bishop's Bible, the Holy Bible, you can see here, they they spelled Holy, H-O-L-I. So Bishop is spelled B-I-S-H-I-P-S instead of H-O-P-S. But this is in 1568. And then finally in 1562, you had the Dewey Reigns Bible. Uh, Many still will use this updated version of the Dewey Reigns Bible. Uh, In 1552, or 1582 rather, the New Testament was was translated, and in 1610, the Old Testament was translated. And then finally, in 1611, you have the most popular version of the English Bible ever translated, and that is the King James Version. Many call this the authorized version, but it's not authorized by God. It's just a version of the Bible. And King James, though, himself had nothing to do with the translation of this Bible. But he considered that that God had put him on this mission to make sure uh, that the Bible was translated uh, there in 1611. And and I've heard of of a lot of people that are partial. Actually, this is my... King James Version here, and I I really do like it. And I know there are a lot of people that are partial to their King James Version. But I had this one guy 
one time tell me that uh, that he only read from the King James Version. I said, well, that's good. He said, yeah, if it ain't 1611, I'm not going to read it. I thought, buddy, you're having a trouble in the 2000s reading as it is. Uh, I don't think you could read a 1611 English Bible. Uh, but he was convinced that the, the Bible he had, the King James Version that he had, the, just like the King James Version I had was the, the actual 1611 King James Version. Folks, it's not. If you have a Bible in your home, I will say there is a possibility, a 99.999% possibility it is not a 1611 a version of the Bible. It's been updated. You, you look in the, the, the first few pages of it, and it will tell you uh, the, the copyright or, or, or the updated version of it. This one that I have um, is 2010. So it's, it's updated in, in, in 2010 and, and updated with, with words that we could read. Folks, if you have a 1611 King James Version, this is what it's going to look like. This is Matthew 6, 9 through 13, which is considered the model prayer. I want you to uh, just take a look at this. And compare it to the King James Version you may have, and I promise you, your King James Version doesn't look like this at all. This is actual 1611 uh, jargon, the way they, they spoke, the way they spelled words. Look at the word manner. After this manner, that's not how we spell it. Therefore, pray ye. We, we don't spell ye with two e's. Our Father which is in... That's a you, folks. That's not a V. In heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, we don't put an E on kingdom, come, thy will be done on earth as it is again in heaven. Give us, G-I-U-E, no, we have a V. They, but they use the U there for the V and the V for the U. Give us this day our daily bread. Again, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Totally different spelling than we use today. Verse 13, and lead us not unto temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Forever. Two different words. Again, a U instead of a V. Evil. Two L's and a U instead of the V. Seriously doubt anyone has that King James Version of 1611 laying around. If you do, I would love, love to look at it. I've got this off my computer. You can still find that on certain Bible software, if you will. But this was uh, what I wanted to do uh, for a, a quick Bible study. I, I really hope you enjoyed it. And Lord willing, this virus will, will go away soon. And we can get back to to our regular meeting times. Uh, I know the elders uh, want us to be safe, and I am so grateful uh, for them and the care that they have for this congregation. We'll close now in a prayer, and thank you again for for watching this this evening. Let's pray. Our glorious heavenly Father, we humbly come before your throne, thanking you so much for allowing us this opportunity to be able to tune in on online and to these various uh, formats to watch and to, to learn more about how we got the Bible from, from the original language to the language that we speak, the English language that we speak today. Lord, may we never take your word for granted. May we always look to it for guidance as it gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. It tells us how we are to live, and may we always live by it. Lord, we ask you to be with so many this evening that are suffering from this horrible COVID virus. Lord, we are grateful that the majority of people are having very light symptoms with it, but Lord, even with light symptoms, it's, it's not fun. Lord, it's not what anybody wants. It's it keeps us away from one another. And, and Lord, we just pray that, that everyone will have light symptoms, that this virus will, 
will calm down and, and that we can just get back to, to a, a normal sense of life, a, a sense of life that, that we are able to come and, and, and to be together without fear or the possibility of getting sick. Lord, be with us. Be with the world. May we always turn to you and may, no matter what is going on in our lives, may you be glorified through it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. But above all, we thank you for your son. And it's in his name we pray. And amen. Thank you again for joining. Have a great week.